Bard on the Box gives way to David Bellamy now, who looks back at Will's world and the wonders of dove droppings. The Elizabethans' passion for gardening all set in motion Britain's largest leisure industry. Their backyards became like garden centres, stuffed full of exotic plants collected from all over the world, which was only then being explored. And they set themselves out in intricate designs and patterns, not only to show off the plants, but also their gardening skills. You weren't meant to get lost in an Elizabethan maze. It was designed for contemplation rather than confusion. The foot maze was originally a Christian symbol of their tortuous path to salvation. The first English gardening books went on sale in the 16th century. Their pages were full of intricate patterns for the knot gardens of those aspiring landscape gardeners. If you stand a little remote from the knot and anything above it, you shall see it appear like a knot made of diverse coloured ribbons. Most pleasing, and most rare. The Elizabethans loved these shady walkways, and the method of doing it is called pleaching, intertwining all the branches of the lime trees together. And I tell you, some of Shakespeare's characters found them pretty handy too. The Prince and Count Claudio, walking in a thick, pleached alley in my orchard, were the by a man of mine. The Elizabethan gardeners were experts on soils. They carefully studied the temperament of each plot of land and prescribed a finely tuned balance of natural pesticides and fertilizers. Dove's dung is the best because it possesses a mighty hotness. A commendation next is attributed to the ass's dung, in that the same beast, for his leisurely eating, digests easier and causes better dung. Take a few of the caterpillars from the next garden or orchard and simmer them in water with herb dill. When cold, sprinkle them on herbs or trees or such places where caterpillars be and the same shall destroy them. Plants were catalogued for the first time in England during the 16th and 17th centuries. Books of botanical drawings along with details of plants and their medicinal use became fashionable. The most popular words of Tudor botanical wisdom were written by one John Gerard in his giant book, The History of Plants. And they're still published today, though in paperback, under the title of Gerard's Herbal. Rosemary is a woody shrub growing oftentimes to a height of three or four cubits. The distilled water from the flowers of rosemary, being drunk at morning and evening, first and last, taketh away the stench from the mouth and breath, and maketh it very sweet. The daisy is called of some herba margarita. The daisies do flower most part of the summer. The juice the leaves and roots sniffed up into the nostrils, purgeth the head mightily, and helpeth the megrim. The same given to little dogs with milk, keepeth them from growing great. Syrup, made of the flowers of borage, comforteth the heart, purgeth melancholy, and quieteth the frantic or lunatic person. Hmm, a useful stuff, that boy, syrup. The English gentry, not content with their pleasure garden, soon began to compete in the ownership of these exotic plants, and the growing of things like oh, yucca and pomegranate soon became an obsession. No, a race! Exotic seeds and pods were found for their cabinets of rarities. Prized specimens were proudly displayed in those fashionable geometric patterns. In 1611, John Tredescan was sent to Europe to hunt for rare and new plants for the Earl of Salisbury's garden at Hatfield House. He returned with treasure of orange, fig and cherry trees. 
as England's first professional plant collector to desk and he's responsible for quite a lot of wonderful things like the double anemone and this plant aptly named after him Aster Tadascantia which is still growing here in the garden at Hatfield House. Now Tradescan's own garden back in London was not only our first museum but our first garden centre because he used to swap bits and pieces with other gardens all over England. Plants arrive from all over the world in the form of seeds and bulbs sent by agents, consuls and ship's captains from the Straits of Magellan, the Cape of Good Hope, Peru and China. The Elizabethan explorers left us a legacy of flowers, shrubs and trees from every part of the newly discovered globe. Marigold arrived from Africa, tulips from the Balkans and the Middle East, tobacco if only it hadn't from the West Indies. Meanwhile, John Gerard was writing at length about his love affair with the newly discovered and luscious love apple. Apples of love grow in Spain, Italy, and such hot countries from whence myself have received seeds for my garden, where they do increase and prosper. They do come in place, fair and goodly apples, chamfered, uneven and bunched out in many places of a bright, shining red colour, and the bigness of a goose egg, or large pippin. Sixty varieties of apples were considered well worth growing in the orchards of the 17th century. And amongst the wonderful characters like five crowns, lemon pippin, golden knob, and Yes, the leather coat russet. And you can still sink your teeth into them today, if you're lucky. It's tempting to think that Shakespeare was a gardener by profession. He certainly wrote a thing or two about plants and pruning. Go by now up yon dangling apricocks, which like unruly children make their sire stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. Plants and flowers were quite more than things of just beauty and scientific curiosity. You see, the Elizabethans had a great sense of allegory, the hidden meaning in their visual patterns, and so flowers and fruit signified spring and the whole prosperity of the Elizabethan era. Queen Elizabeth herself was symbolised by the virgin Tudor rose. The rose doth deserve a chief and prime place among all flowers whatsoever, being not only esteemed for his beauty, virtues, and his fragrant and odoriferous smells, but also because it is the honour and ornament of our English scepter, as by the conjunction appeareth between the uniting of those two most royal houses of Lancaster and you. With new patterns and plants, gardens blossomed a whole cultural pursuit of the English. Francis Bacon summarised it all up at the end of Shakespeare's day when he wrote in his essay on gardens, God first planted the garden, and indeed it is the purest of human pleasure. It is the greatest refreshment to the spirits of man.